Hey, what's up guys, it's Jonathan here, back with another public stock portfolio update. So in this video, we'll do a recap of some of the moves that we made in the portfolio this week. Then we'll do a recap of how the entire portfolio is doing overall. Then we'll talk about a couple of highlights from this week and some things to watch out for that may affect the market in the future. With all that said, please hit the like button for YouTube algorithm and let's get right into it. As always, we deposited the $10 that we normally do every single week into the account. And unfortunately this week we didn't make any buys, but we did make a couple of sales. One thing I will say to start off with this is that I don't really like selling shares. For me mentally, it's a very difficult thing to do. But in this situation, I felt like it was very important that I went ahead and I did do this. The first position that I sold out of was Robinhood. So I sold about $16.28 of Robinhood at $11.10 a share. Generally, financial stocks do well in interest rate hike cycles. But recently, the Fed has been a little bit more dovish, mostly due to conflict that we're seeing taking place in Ukraine. But eventually, the Fed will have to go back on the hawkish stance. There's a decent portion of people who believe at some point the Fed will have to take action to bring inflation back down to normal levels. And that may be as far as the Fed forcing the economy into a recession. I think what they're trying to do is that by putting it off, they're trying to avoid a situation where they overcompensate for inflation and ends up pushing us into a stagflationary period. But at the same time, I do feel like there is a lot of um, risk on the other side of things that they don't do enough and inflation starts to become more widespread inside our entire economic system. In a bear market where almost everyone is losing money, a lot of people tend to leave the stock market, mostly because they don't believe that they can make mar money in the market in the short term. And even though this is the wrong way to think about investing in stocks, this is the way, unfortunately, that a good chunk of people look at the stock market. And when people leave the stock market, then less transactions are made, which means lower revenue and lower growth rates for Robinhood. And on top of that, currently the company has no path to profitability. And this market currently doesn't like companies that don't have a path to profitability. Heck, they don't even like companies that do have a path to profitability, but are not currently profitable. Robinhood is definitely facing a very steep mountain in front of them. And I will admit that I should have seen this a lot sooner. I think for me, my bullishness on Robinhood as a platform made me overlook all these red flags that I've been seeing in the markets recently. Even for someone like me who tried all kinds of different brokerages, I still like Robinhood the best because I can make buy and sell transactions the quickest on Robinhood. I know that there's some people who don't like Robinhood because of some of the things they've done in the past. But when it comes from a usability standpoint, I really like Robinhood. Then the second position that we completely sold our position out of was Redfin. And we sold about $1.60 of Redfin at $19.78 a share. And this sell was mostly driven by the possibility of more aggressive rate hikes in the future. And in my opinion, I think that the real estate market is going to have somewhat of a setback. Maybe not necessarily like a crash or anything like that. But I think it will face some headwinds as we start to see rates move up. We start to see the consumer maybe become a little bit weaker. Maybe not to the point of a recession, but... Definitely, we start to see a consumer that doesn't have as much buying power in the marketplace, which will then lower demand for real estate overall. And for me, I'd much rather take that cash and go use it to do something else. I feel like I've talked about this in the past couple of stock market update videos, but one thing I will say is that one of the things you notice about the two companies I sold, they're either not profitable or they don't have um, very high margin. This market doesn't like companies that are not profitable and likes companies that have really high margins and really good growth at the same time. So this would be companies like Tesla or Nvidia, um, just to name a couple. So let's go into my iPad. And let's do a quick recap of how the portfolio is doing overall. So currently the portfolio sits at $212.67 and it's down about 20%. Currently, we have about $60 worth of cash in this account as well. And the first position we have here is Enphase. Our Enphase position is actually up 5% now. And Enphase has performed pretty well this week, mostly due to some of the energy price fears that we have um, seen the market respond to this past like week, week and a half or so. And when people are afraid that oil prices are going to go up, they start to think to themselves, oh, maybe I should buy an EV car 
and then maybe get some solar panels as well so I don't have to pay these absorbably high gas prices. So renewable energy stocks like Enphase tend to do well in those situations. And currently Enphase makes about 19% of the portfolio. Our next position here is Tesla. Um, Tesla again, another alternative energy company. Um, they're down in our portfolio 8% but they haven't performed as well as Enphase has, which is a little bit more of a pure energy play. Whereas Tesla has the solar, they have their vehicles, they have a lot of different things going on. Tesla is down 8% in our portfolio and makes up a little over 17.5% of the portfolio. Next position we have here is NVIDIA. Our NVIDIA position is currently down about 13% and makes up about 8% of our portfolio. Like I said, um, the first three companies that we just talked about, Enphase, Tesla, and NVIDIA, that's about, what, 40, 45% of the portfolio right there. Most of my portfolio is made up of very profitable growth tech companies that have the margins to be able to take the hit of inflation if necessary. Even our next position as well is another good example of these high margin companies. And that position is Google. Our Google position is currently down about 9 and a third percent. It makes up about 8% of the portfolio. Next position we have here is Etsy. Again, high margin company. It's currently down 34%. It makes up a little under 8% of the portfolio. The reason why Etsy is getting beat down so hard is because with Etsy, they're facing the headwinds of higher shipping costs. Also with that, and then also the fact that there's fears that, that the consumer might not have as much discretionary income because they're trying to fight off energy inflation, which gives them less discretionary income. That's why we're gonna see stocks like Etsy and Amazon, all these um, consumer discretionary stocks start to sell off massively. We saw it with Amazon, how it dropped from, I think like 3,300 all the way down to like I think now it's at like 2,800 or something like that. Um, Etsy taking a hit, 34% down in our portfolio. Um, Etsy used to be a stock that you would have a hard time getting it under 200, and now it's at 121. So it's really important to understand these macroeconomics and be able to tie it together and use it to assess your portfolio. So the next question we have here is Amazon, again, like I said, Amazon's down 13%. Um, with Amazon, I think the thing that is saving them a little bit, why they're not getting Etsy'd, is because they have so many different diverse um, offerings. They have AWS, they have all different kinds of things. This, their business is not just retail. So that right now is kind of saving their stock price. Um, currently our Amazon position makes up about 3.5% of the portfolio. The next position we have here is Cloudflare. Cloudflare is a SaaS company and kind of what we saw um, this week with DocuSign. SaaS companies are getting hit pretty hard recently. We will talk about what happened with DocuSign a little later on in the video, but Cloudflare is right in the cross here. It's one of those high PE software companies that the market has zero interest in saving right now. Um, that position currently makes up 2% of my portfolio. Next position we have here is Matterport. Our Matterport position is down almost 56%. Matterport is the same game. There's, they're not profitable. They don't have a path to profitability. The market doesn't really care for it. I think Matterport right now is at like, what, $7. Wow. It was at $6 this, some point this week. So... Um, currently makes up 2% portfolio. Next position we have here is Trade Desk. Um, Trade Desk has been getting beat up pretty badly recently. I haven't really spent the time to look into it, but my guess would be that because of the supply chain issues, if we start to have factors that make the supply chain issues worse, kind of like the conflict that we're seeing in Ukraine take place, that would only um, take less money away from advertisers which would take the price of advertisers like Trade Desk, Google, Facebook, so on and so on. So we're down 32% on that. It makes up about 1.5% of the portfolio. Trade Desk is a profitable company. Our next position here is SoFi. Um, SoFi is a unprofitable company, but it is on a path to profitability. I think that their expectation is to reach profitability in the next two or three quarters. Um, currently, we're down about 36% on this 
on this position and makes up one and a half percent of the portfolio. Um, next position we have here is Palantir. Our Palantir position is down almost 50% and makes up a little over 1% of the portfolio. Palantir is in the same bucket as Cloudflare. Um, Palantir does have a better path to profitability. I will give them that. But again, that high PE, the market just does not care for it right now. So to do a quick recap of um, some of the major events that happened this week. So on Tuesday, President Biden did ban all imports of Russian oil to the U.S. via a executive order. The goal is to stop funding Putin's military that's currently fighting up against Ukraine. But the crazy thing about it is that even though the most re recent CPI print that we just got, energy inflation came in at 25.6% year over year. The Wall Street Journal read a poll that said that 79% of Americans support this move of banning Russian oil, even though it will cause energy prices to rise. And when this announcement was made, it was actually pretty interesting because we actually saw oil futures sell off a bit from its peak at 130 a barrel earlier this week to its low of this week of about $110 per barrel. In my opinion, this price action, due to this being a buy the rumor, sell the news event, because rumors were stirring around for about a week that the US may possibly ban Russian oil. And because there was so much trader momentum about that, that trader momentum ended up pushing up oil futures to a level that wasn't sustainable given what the actual fundamentals were going to do. And the same thing that happened, oil happens in stocks all the time. So this is something good to keep in mind. But even with that downturn that we saw intra-week with oil futures, we still have higher than normal elevated gas prices. So it'll be interesting to see where oil prices go from here and how much that affects inflation overall. But we'll get more in depth about inflation later on in the video. So then on Wednesday, Biden did sign an executive order on um, covering crypto regulation. This executive order outlined six key priorities of national policy concerning digital assets, which included consumer and investor protection, financial stability, illicit finance, economic competitiveness, financial inclusion, and innovation. The executive order pretty much directed various federal government agencies to develop policies to meet the priority goals. And when these priorities did talk about the possibility of a U.S. central bank digital currency, and the executive order did direct the Fed to continue its research on the possibility of having a United States central bank digital currency, or CBDC for short. And even though the old school Bitcoin bulls don't necessarily like the fact that government is starting to try to regulate cryptocurrencies. This is good news for crypto investors overall, because if there's a more concrete way of regulating cryptos, it starts to draw in more big money, which can really help the price of Bitcoin move up over time and get us even closer to $100,000 Bitcoin. Then on Thursday, we got the CPI print for February and the reading came out as 0.8% month over month increase and a 7.9% year-over-year increase, which was pretty on board with what the market expected. And some of the most notable categories from the CPI print included fuel that's gone up about 38% year-over-year. And one thing that we should keep in mind with fuel price is that the Russia-Ukraine conflict started on February 24th. So most of the increase in gas prices that are caused due to that conflict have not been priced into CPI very well. So it is important to understand that this number could get a lot worse in the next CPI print. Like I said before, oil has the power to affect almost every supply chain. So it can make almost every product more expensive. So it is very important that we do watch out for next CPI print and see how much of a role energy did play in that new CPI print. On Thursday at the close of the market, both Rivian and DocuSign announced earnings for the previous quarters. Rivian missed suspected EPS by almost 100%. They mostly blamed um, the supply chain constraints and also the increased cost of material and labor on their inability to meet Wall Street's expectations. They also adjusted their production outlook as well to reflect this. All this bad news caused Rivian stock to fall 14% after hours. And in the case of DocuSign, they gave worse than expected growth guidance. And this pretty much just shows that 
a lot of the demand for DocuSign was pulled forward by the pandemic, which has significantly shrinking their growth rate. I believe the quarter that they just wrapped up, they had about a 45% growth rate. And this year, they're projecting to only have an 18% growth rate. And this news caused the stock to fall 20% in the after hours. So that's basically all I got for you guys this week. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting not only the like button, but also the subscribe button. Think about it. If you've made it this far to this video, you'll probably like some of the other videos that I post. I talk about all things stock market related, personal finance, real estate investing. So if any of that interests you, consider hitting that subscribe button and notification bell so you get notified every time I post a new video. Also, let me know what you guys think about the markets in the comments down below. I'd love to hear from you guys. Check me out on all my social medias and try to post there as often as possible. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.